Welcome to Preservation Perspectives, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation's podcast, or better known as ACHP. I'm your host, Monica Rhodes. I'm an expert member on the ACHP, which is an independent federal agency that promotes the economic, educational, environmental, sustainability, and cultural values of historic preservation. The ACHP also advises the President and Congress on National Historic Preservation Policy. President Biden signed a proclamation declaring September 15th to October 15th, National Hispanic Heritage Month. While Ybor City, an area of Tampa, Florida, has a rich multicultural roots, it started as a cigar factory company town in the late 1800s, where many Cuban, Spanish, and Italian immigrants settled and worked in the factories. Today, the Ybor City Historic District is a national historic landmark that has almost 1,000 historic buildings. We are pleased to have with us Arminda Mata, CEO and curator of the Ybor City Museum Society. Welcome, Arminda. Thank you. So Arminda, we're just gonna jump right into the conversation today. Uh, What is the Ybor City Museum Society and what is your role in the preservation of Ybor City's many historic buildings? Well, uh, being the Ybor City Museum Society, our mission is to celebrate our heritage in Ybor City. Um, We are part of many, we're just a small part of a huge community that cares a lot about the city. We love Ybor City. Uh, We live and breathe from the chickens to the factories, everybody, and it's a big community. It's a family. Ybor City was built on a community, and it it still maintains that that tight relationship. And we're just a small part of keeping the the heritage. Uh, We do more of the heritage, but one of the things that we do to bring awareness to our buildings and our city is every March this year, I'm sorry, 2024 will be our 12th annual. We do a Buildings Alive architectural hop. And that's where people come, they get on a trolley, they ride around to six different buildings. It could be one of the old social clubs, the original, um, it was the original Florida uh, brewery, which was the first in the state of Florida and is now a a law firm. It could be La Segunda Bakery, who is running with the fifth generation in the same bakery that that was uh, around at the beginning. And the fifth fifth generation. Fifth generation. We have several of those here in Ybor City. And what they do is they pay a price, they get free food and drink at each location, and they get a behind the scenes historical tour of the history of the building. And it's a way that we promote the preservation um, efforts. One place that we had that's an old cigar factory is now Lion's Eye Institute, which is one of the biggest eye implant companies in the world. And so um, it's a great way to show people the the businesses that are moving in and preserving these these beautiful buildings. Um, And you never know we have right behind us an old, the last wooden cigar factory that is now an apartment complex. This is this is incredible. So this event is March of 2024, right? It's, it's every a- March that okay. it will be our 12th annual. And this is our small way of, of participating in the, the historic preservation. Oh, wow. So this, it sounds like, I mean, with a thousand buildings preserved, these types of tours, the interpretation that happens at the, at the Ybor City Museum Society, there's this huge preservation ecosystem that has been built around uh, this important work that you and others are helping to lead. So Arminda, the question that I'm thinking about is what has been, you know, as a national historic landmark, uh, what does that meant to Ybor City uh, and some of the residents and the tourists that come to, to see these places? Well, one great thing about having that is prior to that, we lost um, uh, about, I believe it was 800 buildings before we were, we were made a national landmark district. And that's a huge loss. I mean, at one time we had two 
over 200 cigar factories in Ybor City alone, which is not really that large of a of, of land-wise, not that large of a place. And um, uh, unfortunately, we lost other buildings like the old firehouse and, and different things like that. So being made a landmark district means now the remaining buildings are protected. Yeah. And, and showing that we're like St. Augustine that everybody knows about um, and goes to and knows that you're going to get a lot of history going through all these stores and everything. Um, having that is a huge draw, not only to Ybor City, but to Tampa as well. Yeah. Um, we have the streetcar that still runs. The, la the first stop is here in Ybor City. And it runs all the way down to downtown Tampa and back, and it's free of charge. So when we have people come in, especially from Europe, off of uh, cruise liners, they get that on downtown and they come on the, the streetcar to Ybor City because they've heard of how beautiful it is and, and the history that they're going to find here. Yeah. I, you know, I, I often think when I'm, you know, I'm traveling and when people talk about tourism, a lot of the things that people are attracted to is heritage tourism. Like they want an right. authentic experience um, to, to see the people who are connected to, to, the, to the culture, to this history, um, to this heritage. And so from your standpoint, what are, what are some of the most historic buildings in Ybor City? Uh, and are they on the tour or what, what are, right. what's happening well, here? One that I mentioned is the original Florida brewery, uh, which uh, Vicente Martinez Ybor, um, you know, he started a, a city and he needed to provide liquor to the, his employees. And so this brewery started um, prior to that, right next to the brewery was all the ice works that was there all the way back to the early, um, I think, 1880s when when it was nothing but a fort and, uh, of soldiers. Yeah. Um, so the building is now a law firm and it's been beautifully remodeled. We also and it has been in the tour. Um, we also have Hotel Haya, which is in an old Las Navidades restaurant. And it is one of the most, it's been recently remodeled in a beautifully, beautifully done um, hotel that gives homage to one of our founders, Ignacio Aya. Um, and then there is J.C. Newman Cigar Factory, which is in the old Reesburg factory. It's still standing and it is the last family owned cigar company in America. And they are on the fourth, third fourth generation yeah. to run it that 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 is absolutely uh incredible i certainly do uh look forward to getting down to ebor city to, mm -hmm. to try these cigars because i know as you said like you know several several of the historical factories still stand today um uh you know some are still operating in, in that way and others have shifted into other types of operations um what are what are some of those other older cigar factories currently being used for now Right. Um, currently, we like I said, we have one right behind us, which is the last wooden structure, because um, unfortunately, there were quite a few fires in the early 1900s. Um, so not many of those survived. Uh, most of them are brick. The okay. last one behind us is apartment complex. Is there the Ebor factory? What mm -hmm. was Ebor for uh, Mar Vicente Martinez Ebor's factory is now uh, Scientology. Uh, building and um, there's a factory down the road that U-Haul is in. So, and additionally to the cigar factories, three of the most beautiful buildings that that we do show are our social aid, our social clubs, which were once Ebor City's mutual aid societies, which were very unique to Ebor City. And the different immigrant populations had their own mutual aid society. Correct. We have an Italian club, two Cuban clubs, two uh, Spanish clubs, and a German American club. Hmm. The German American club is now Metro Health. Okay. And the Italian club, the Cuban club, and Centro Asturiano still stand as the same so, um, social clubs that they were. And they were all three buildings were built around 1914. And they're still just as beautiful as ever with all mostly um, 
very seldom do they have anything that's not um, uh, authentic to when they were built. And they, uh, they all three are always in, in the hop. Yeah. So they're beautiful buildings. One of the fascinating things uh, that I read when I was uh, preparing for the interview was that they, there is a, a trilingual newspaper. Uh, yes, like a seca. Yeah, one of the only uh, trilingual newspaper in, in the nation. Uh, so yes. English, Spanish, and Italian. Yes. That's yes, it. and it is still um, Patrick who who runs it. He is um, the grandson of the gentleman who started it. And um, I believe great grandson. Um, I don't know quite. Um, but the reason the trilingual was needed is because our three biggest languages spoken was Sicilian, mm. because Sicilian had its own dialect of Italian. So we had Sicilian, uh, Spanish, and English. And so it is still the only trilingual newspaper in, that exists in the United States. Yeah, I, I I just spent about six months in Sicily, so I certainly know that there are, there's a difference between like you know Italian special dialect. And it is, <laughs> it is beautiful, beautiful, and you know that Armenda, that's a, a great segue to my next question about the descendants mm -hmm. of the original family. So you talk about Patrick, uh, grandfather, great grandfather, uh, establishing the newspaper, and he's still mm -hmm. working in there. Are there other um, descendants of the original yeah. founders of the city and so, how them engage with, with them? So we have the Newmans um, and they run the J.C. Newman Cigar Factory. There's also the Gunsmarts who um, own and operate the, uh, the Columbia Restaurant, which everybody knows mm -hmm. of. The Columbia Restaurant was built in what we found out in 1903, not 1905, but there was some damage. <laughs> 1905 is their celebration date. Okay. Um, they're being ran by the fifth generation. Um, the La Segunda Bakery as well, fifth generation. Um, we have quite a few attorneys that still practice law here in Ybor City whose families came to Ybor City. The majority of our members have were from here when their parents or grandparents came here. Um, one thing, it's it's quite funny. When I first started as the CEO, I got asked, are you from Ebor? And I'm like, no, sorry. Uh, I'm an outsider, but I love Ebor. <laughs> and um, because you would be surprised when they left. Um, for example, an, a, another very famous person, is Lou Pinella, who hmm. played Major League Baseball. He was from West Tampa, just over the bridge, but we still claim West Tampa and Ebor because they worked side by side. Yeah. It's all the places he went in the world. Tampa's his home. He came right back here where he grew up. And the majority of our players we have, uh, we own and operate the Tampa Baseball Museum. That's part of our our contribution also to Ebor because it is the home of Al Lopez who was the first major league player of Hispanic descent, the first manager and the first hall of famer to come out of Ybor city. And our baseball museum is in his childhood home. And his son comes by and visits the museum all the time. And so you see these family members that even if they move away, they always come back to yeah. where they grew up. So it's a special place. It's a very special place. Yeah, with a, with a, a a deep deep respect for baseball. I'm a, a huge baseball fan, so I see the the sign on the back. Yes. Uh, and yes. so many players are coming out of Ebor City and in, in Tampa. We have 92 major league players who have come out of Tampa in Hillsborough County, and we have a wall of baseballs that was donated to us when we opened the museum, and 85 of those are signed by the major league players that came out of out of this area. So it, it's it's a fab, fascinating place to work. I, I love being here. And I actually drive well over an hour to get here every day to show how much I love to be here. <laughs> yeah. So so in, so now it, it, hearing like all this baseball heritage coming out. So there's something in the food because I heard the food is absolutely incredible. And there's something in the water that's producing these baseball players coming out of Tampa and Ybor City in particular. So that's that's amazing. Um, yeah. 
So uh, Arminda, so I know, you know, people can take the tour uh, on March, uh, that's coming up in March, 2024, um, but are there other types of tours that people can take to get to know Absolutely. Ybor City? We have um, our Ybor City Visitor Center. Um, they, they, have, they have people come in, they show them around, they give them flyers for all the places around Ybor so that they can walk around. It's a very walkable place. Okay. And um, there is a, a local walking tour that we're very close to the, the two gentlemen that give these walking tours. And they literally, it doesn't matter if it's in the dead heat of summer, 90 degrees, they will walk you around Tampa. Just bring your water bottles because you're going to need them. Okay. Um, but we have walking tours. We do tours. We do tours of the baseball museum. We are right next to a state park, which is the Ybor City Museum State Park. Yeah. We also help support them and help them with their, their exhibits. Um, we go out, we've just started the this new program where we have a mobile museum because I really got tired of locals saying, oh, I did not know you were here. Yeah. So it's like, that's a problem if you don't know <laughs> we exist. So we started a mobile museum to where we go to schools, senior citizen facilities, because I, I, I started feeling like, especially after COVID, mm -hmm. people are not wanting to get out as much. So we go to them, we take artifacts, we take slideshows, and we give them the history of Ybor City to draw people back in. Um, we also go to businesses all over Tampa, St. Petersburg, Clearwater, we go down to Sarasota. So it's a way of getting our history out there in the public. And, and But there are so many tours here. There's three museums in half a block radius of each other. So, Well, Armenda, I, I uh, completely agree. Like if people are not coming to the museum, then you bring the museum to them. Uh, right. And so what has been the reception from like, you know, seniors, you say you go to senior citizens homes uh, or, or um, communities, as well as young people. How are, how are they like receiving the this? The seniors especially are very receptive and okay. they're very happy that they're not being forgotten. Mm -hmm. And so we'll take it and they love the old pictures even more than the children because it's a reminiscent. We, yep. we show Ebor from 1885 to 1955 and so they reminisce about hey I remember that I remember when that was there and and um we we give them those stories we we try, we try to take like we have these little Tampa baseball stress balls and they love those so we give them as rifle like door prizes yeah. and stuff and we created a line of postcards that we give to them because they love still writing letters and, and sending them through the mail. So um, we try to do that. And with kids, we try to give them free tickets to the baseball museum to bring the parents out. And so we just sponsored our first little league team and we, and oh. Friday night was pitcher night. So we took a little table and put little Al Lopez signed um baseball up and talk to them about the museum so it it's a fun way of really getting out and just being with you know getting involved with the community and and having that connection with the community so so the ebor city museum society has a, a sponsor of baseball so they have their your names on the well uh, yes actually we're the ebor city museum society but we own and operate the tampa baseball museum okay so so you're gonna see the tampa baseball museum this logo right here yeah you see that on the back of their shirts Oh. And it's and, and we just posted on our Facebook page the little picture that we took with the guys with me. And it's pretty sad because I'm four foot eleven. So all of the kids are taller than me. But uh, so we had it, it was it was a very fun night. And and a lot of the parents said the same thing. We did not know you were there. And I love baseball. <laughs> so that's, that's so yeah, I, I grew up playing Little League Baseball. And so, you know, we had Dairy Queen as a sponsor, but I would have loved to be, have been sponsored right. by a museum. That, how, how incredible is that? Yeah. And it's it's very neat because um, there's a misconception about our mu museum that we're the baseball museum of the Tampa Bay Rays, mm -hmm. but we're not. We are the Tampa Baseball Museum and we give 135 years of baseball history here in Ybor City in Tampa. Yeah. which started with the inner city cigar leagues 
the cigar factories had their own baseball leagues and it started in 1914 and we had social leagues and the social clubs had their own leagues and the the police force and the the um the electric company they all had leagues and they played each other yeah and then shushu worth who was one of the ladies that the a league of their own was inspired by she was born and raised here in ebor city and one of the best women players in the in the American in the women's league. So there's women baseball. Jackie Robinson played here in Plant Field. Yeah. And we have this giant mural of Jackie Robinson playing that shows uh him playing on plant in Plant Field. And we have um the Tampa uh, Tampa Yankees, which is minor league team. We have our minor teams. We have our major teams. We have our spring chain, training, which the New York Yankees, uh, their spring training is in Tampa, so they're included. We have a giant picture of Al Lopez and Babe Ruth. <laughs> so it's not just, it's it's 135 years of baseball history that started in Ebor City. Wow. So I was I was reading when Vicente Martinez Ebor established the, the city, started bringing in you know cigar, you know, and he he encouraged other factories to also come so they could really right. build out this community of people. Right. Um, but in addition to that, they were creating teams and social right. around it, which is it makes absolute sense, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but then this this is for this legacy that can still continue uh, well beyond. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would imagine even his imagination. Um, right. That's 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 a. Pretty and when you mentioned the legacy, that's one thing I would like to say is one, another way we we keep the families connected. We have what we call the Legacy Awards, and June of next year will be our 40th annual Legacy Award. And what it is is we celebrate. There's three major major awards. It's the Vicente Martinez Ybor Award, the Adela Gunsmart Award and the uh, Anthony Tony Pizzo Award. Okay. Vicente, of course, was the founder, so that's for philanthropy and contributions to business and, and, and things like that. Uh, Tony Pizzo was our uh, local historian, and so that's more with the arts and history and um, music and, and things like that and contributions to Ybor. And then Adela Gunsmart, is the granddaughter of the man who started the Columbia. She was also into the arts and music, and she was a pianist. She went to Juilliard and was a trained pianist, and she was also a philanthropist. So that's for people who have shown that. We just added the fourth award last year, which will be the Lou Pinella Award for Lou Pinella, and that will be someone in the sports world who has also shown contributions to the city. And what's wonderful about these awards is that they're when they are given to the people who have won that year, they're given by a family member of the named awardee. Last year, the great, great grandson of Vicente Martinez Ybor, his name is Rafael Martinez Ybor, and he is 94 years old, he was able to give Lou Pinella Jr. the award for the Vicente Martinez Award last year. So that's the wonderful thing is that the family members are still in in tune with this this legacy and they give the legacy award to the new person. So it, it's a great award system. No, no, absolutely. And it's a way to you know keep the, the family's names alive. And it's mm -hmm. also an incredible opportunity to just to honor the impact uh, mm -hmm. that uh, people who are living to, today uh, have made and continue to make in Ebor City. Like that level of, of leadership and vision continues. Uh, the other thing that I also think about uh, as we were, because there are a thousand historic buildings uh, mm -hmm. as a part of the, the National Historic Landmark District, um, I'm thinking about like the real estate development community and the fact mm -hmm. that I'm sure that there are, you know, developers who are, are, have been sensitive or working with community members and taking advantage of the historic tax credits with mm -hmm. incentivizes historic preservation all, all through through the yeah. city. Can you speak a little bit more to, you know, how has the development community uh, worked uh, or continues to right. work uh, to preserve these places? 
Absolutely. One big thing that that um, Ebor has gone through different cha challenges and changes over time. Um, you know, it was the cigar industry, and then when the cigars started failing, um, Ebor went through a very rough time and got a bad reputation for being dangerous. It went and through the, being, the Great Depression that the cigar correct. Industry. Okay. started to go yeah. down and a lot that actually was Hollywood had a, a little bit to do with that as well um but they um and then in the 80s and 90s you had this wonderful influx of artists come back in and so these artists were getting these these old cigar buildings because it was cheap at the time they could get studios and and they just started putting their love into Ebor. Well, then the developers started coming in and started seeing that with all these artists and communities, if they could work together, they could start building more of bringing back Ebor to a functioning place. Because let's face, face it, we're not bringing back the cigar industry, <laughs> you know. So these buildings had to be repurposed. Yeah. So, you know, now they're apartment complexes, they're dance studios, they're the um, one of our big crest buildings is now an art studio. Um, you have a lot of businesses, uh, 7th Avenue, which is our main street. Um, you can go up and down 7th Avenue and there's old restaurants in the bottom part of cigar factories or what was a boarding house is now a restaurant or a so, so the it's more of a way to develop it as a livable, mm -hmm. exciting, you know, uh, exciting place to be that is also safe to raise families because we still have our casitas, which is what the baseball museum's in, and we're known for those little casitas, and people are coming in and they're they're redoing their we we our offices are in a casita, okay. and they're redoing these and upgrading them to be homes and businesses so yeah I, I just I think that Ybor City is a fantastic example of, of preservation when you bring all different types of industries or disciplines or types of people together um, around a common cause and that's to preserve the legacy of such a, uh, a an important place to uh, the national story here uh, right. and the other thing I also think about is you know historic preservation has a, a, a you know semi bad reputation of everything like no you can't do that we want to keep it old we want to keep things just the way they are a lot right. of the time and you know hats off to uh, the leaders in the community the community members who are part of this the process the developers um, because that just doesn't happen preservation right. just doesn't happen without intention vision uh, and and that's and that's how you get a national historic landmark district right. with a thousand buildings. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I I'm going to steal the words of of one of my friends, Joe Halden, who who leads the the uh, walking tour. He said that Ebor is something different to everybody. Mm -hmm. You have the artists who came in in the '80s that said, you know, I remember Ebor as the art central. And then you have, you know, the young people of the nineties. I remember Ebor as the party capital. And, and then you have the older generation that remembers Ebor as, as that end of that cigar era and their grandparents being the workers who came in. So the memory of Ebor is different for everybody, but if you can learn to have a common goal, that's what makes the new Ebor. And our next generation is going to have a different idea of what Ebor is to them. And um, so it's it, it's an interesting thing. When he said that, I was like, that's it. it there's a, a different Ebor to every person. And if we have a common goal, that's what keeps us moving forward and, and preserving for the future generation. Absolutely. And, and to that, you know, knowing that our work is 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 really a conversation also about the the future like what is why are we preserving it's like so people in the future who haven't been born yet can also right. understand the importance of this legacy how are how are young people interacting with this history what do you think uh you know 10 15 years from now the the people who are coming up will what would they right. think of Ybor city what what's well, the future of the and that's that's where I come in. That's where my passion, especially with this mobile museum, is coming. Is I started looking at our memberships, and and it's that generation who remembers the first 
generation who came in. It was either their grandparents or their great grandparents, and they remember their parents and their grandparents and all the stories. Yeah. But the further you get removed from those generations, there's not as much of a bond as there are with this generation. So I'm trying to find a way to interest young people. One of the ways that, and they're such a great partner of ours, is it's HCC, Hillsborough Community College. Their arts district, of course, their art school is here in Ybor City. Their dance studio is in an old clinic that used to be one of uh, Centro Espanol's clinics that they had. They had multiple hospitals and clinics. So now that is now a dance studio. They have also been part of the Buildings of Life. <laughs> but we use their dancers, like we have a, a, an event coming up in October where the dancers are gonna come and do a dance. So we have that partnership with the dance instructors and the, and in fact, the dance instructor, her parents are from Ebor City. <laughs> she grew up here and she came back after moving away. She came back and is now teaching dance. And um, she is a great, she and I have a great uh, business and partnership that we're trying to get those kids involved and having the artists come out and having the drama school come out and do reenactments for us and, and things like that to get that interest going with the college age students. And yeah. then we take the, um, it's great because I go on Walgreens, I love Walgreens and, and they do the 49 cent pictures and, and, you know, kids do not know that those are reprinted they yeah. just look old, you yeah. know, they're black and whites and they look old. So I print off these multitude of pictures that we have and like kids actually touch them because then they think they're touching something old and it's so important to them that they get to touch it. Yep. And that's what we're trying to do to take that into the schools and give, because you go to a museum and everything's behind glass, you yep. know, but this is something they can touch. And that's, that's something that we, we do like to, to try you know, to do. The, the incredibly innovative thing that I'm hearing is, you know, when you think about, you know, heritage, it's not, not just the buildings, like, you know, preserving right. historic buildings, that's important, but the beautiful right. thing is what, what happened in and around those buildings. So like pulling on this cigar legacy, the, the cultural legacy of that, um, the, the sports baseball history, the arts, like bringing that back. Right. Um, to it and introducing that to a, a younger generation. And, you know, these things can be cyclical, you know, maybe there's right. another chapter where uh, there will be more cigar factories or more sports uh, teams. Right. Uh, you know, there's, there's so much possibility. Uh, right. I think, Arminda, you are doing an incredible job with helping to lead Thank the car on what the future. Of Thank you. And the past. Of e yeah, I, I, I told I, I, I told my team, I said, we are officially the I said our official titles now are cheerleaders for Ebor City. That's what we're here for. That's what we need to do is just keep on, you know, cheering on because it, like I said, it's a community event. Ebor City grew, um, well, Tampa, Ebor City. In, in 1880, there was about 800 people. By 1900, the cigar business came 1885. First cigar rolled uh, was April 13th, 1886. By 1900, there was over 15,000 people. Now, just think of that. 15 years. Yeah. 15,000 people eight from 800. Yeah. And that was built by a community. Some of these cigar workers they from Cuba and Spain, some of them never learned English, but they could speak Sicilian mm -hmm. because they worked side by side in these cigar factories and it's a beautiful story but it's still preserved today and people don't see that is where I promote the visitor center I promote the state park I promote Columbia restaurant or the JC Newman cigar factory they do us you know they're like oh have you heard about the baseball museum if you're interested in this you would love to go to the baseball museum and that's how you know, and it's funny because I go to these like a um, chamber luncheon and it's like you're meeting old friends, you know, because you work so closely yeah. together and it, it's a beautiful story. And it, I wish more cities, even if they weren't historical, mm -hmm. you know, districts, 
could work as that community and yeah. it would strengthen so many cities if we could oh, yeah. do that. When your foundation is, in, is intercultural, it becomes a part mm -hmm. of how you work, a part of a future that you, uh, a shared future that you imagine together. So Armenda, exactly. my question is, how can, how can people learn more about uh, Ybor City, uh, the Ybor City uh, Museum? Um, if we, our website is ybor, um, ybormuseum.org. Um, and if you go on our website and you can sign up for newsletters, my newsletters are simple. It's what we're doing and what our community's doing. It shows you all of the events coming up for the Italian club and, and, you know, JC Newman. So it's a way of just boosting the community. Um, you can, and it shows you any events that we have coming up and anything special for the community. You also get the history of Ybor. Uh, you get the history and I show any of our local places like the visitor center, and then it gives you links to where you can go to their websites as well. Perfect. Well, Arminda, thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, and be sure to follow the ACHP on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube to keep up with the latest on historic preservation news. I'm Monica Rhodes. Thank you for joining Preservation Perspectives. <music>